some beds were actually invented to prevent or cure uh, skin cancer. And then all of a sudden, this whole shift that the sun is dangerous. Um, talk talk us through yeah. that. Tell us tell us about your post that got you in trouble on the naughty step. <laughs> it was the first time I had ever been censored. Now I, I'm like an old hack. Right? <laughs> <laughs> aren't we all, love? Aren't we all? <laughs> yeah. But at the time, it, it really... Um, I was shocked and I wondered what I did wrong and, you know, kept trying to figure out. And we had this long lingering infection. And I said, what do you do when you have a long lingering infection? You know, I do what any normal person would do. I take my kids to the beach and we get naked and in the sun. And there were no naked pictures. There was, I was just talking about skin exposure and it was immediately removed. Welcome to The Wellness Way with me, Philly J. Lay, a lay person's guide to your natural health systems, your very own NHS. Hello, lovely people, and Happy New Year. And if you're feeling like leaving last year behind you and stepping into a whole new world of health, today's guest is a perfect person to listen to as we chat through all the wonderful, predominantly free things that you can do for your health. Uh, And without further ado, I am going to introduce you to the amazing Dr. Catherine Clinton, ND. She is a licensed naturopathic physician with a focus on gut health, autoimmunity, and she is a psychoneuroimmunologist. So that's a very interesting thing. We'll get we'll get to that later, Dr. Catherine. Uh, but you have a focus on gut health uh, because of something that happened to you when you were at medical school, which we will again talk about. Um, so Dr. Catherine is also passionate about the connections we have with the world around us and how these connections can regenerate our health and the health of the planet. She sees an urgent need for healing our internal terrain as well as healing the terrain of the world we live in. Dr. Catherine Clinton, welcome to The Wellness Way. Thank you so much for having me. I love your work and it's an honor to be here today talking about my favorite subjects. Thank you. Oh, my favorite subjects too. I can't wait. So first of all, I'd just like you to tell a little bit about your story so that our audience can get to know you and what you went through when you were at naturopathic medical school. Absolutely. Absolutely. I got my first introduction to natural health by assisting with a midwife for six, seven years. And that led me to naturopathic medical school. And it was my second year of school. And just like uh, allopathic medical school, it had a real initiation phase, right? Really long hours, long in class hours, long clinic hours. And I, by my second year, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, which is an autoimmune condition that affects the colon, and thyroiditis, Hashimoto thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune condition that affects the thyroid gland and also Lyme disease. So I was sort of racking up. Yeah. Racking them up. (laughs) Yep, exactly. When I do it, I really do it. So um, (laughs) And I was in the right place to be sick, right? I was in this naturopathic medical school. We were right down the school um, hill from an allopathic medical school, OHSU, very open and alternative, worked in collaboration with naturopaths. Um, There was a acupuncture school as well. So I had so many modalities to help me piece back together my health, but What I realized was once I did do that and put the pieces back of my physical health, there was still something missing. I had regained that health that I had before I was diagnosed, but for anyone that has a chronic condition or disease, they know that that picture right before you're diagnosed isn't the picture of health, right? I was able to like rejoin society continue in school, do all those things, but there was still a piece missing. And it wasn't until I started studying and researching psychoneuroimmunology and how, that's a really big word, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's but it's a, a fantastic word. one. <laughs> it is, it's it's so the key amazing. to, it's the key to everything really, isn't it? 
It really, really is. It opens up a whole new paradigm for health. And that's what it did for me. And it's a big fancy word for how our thoughts impact our health. And they have a direct impact. And that's really what opened the door to quantum biology for me. I started mm -hmm. studying that. I studied studying the mitochondria. And from there, I realized that what we learned in school, that chemical model, that mechanistic model of the key in the lock floating around the body and finding each other just isn't adequate. We know that we have trillions of cells in the body, right? And yep. each one of those cells has over 100,000 tasks that is being performed every second. I'm just going to say that again because it's like astronomical. Over 100,000 tasks are being done in one of our trillions of cells every second. And that lock and key model that we learned in school is just not efficient or sufficient to really describe the speed and efficiency with which our body reacts. And quantum biology really opens up a beautiful window into how these smaller pieces are powering our bigger biology. And so psychoneuroimmunology opened up that window, opened up that door, and I haven't looked back since. It's absolutely amazing. It, it, it is. I remember when I read um, Dr. Bruce Lipton's book, The Biology of Belief, uh, and that was, um, <laughs> I, I say quite a lot, actually, one of those fuck you moments where I'm just going, really? We, we have this power and nobody's told us about us. And it is mind blowing, isn't it? I mean, those are big, 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 big numbers that you're talking about. <laughs> so, so um you so you healed yourself by using all of these techniques mm -hmm. and using your mind to put the last pieces of the puzzle back into place uh, and this took you on a journey uh, with a passion for helping especially children with autoimmune diseases and gastrointestine tract issues um, mm -hmm. so I think to I started my journey with diet and nutrition, and I know that you've got um, a great passion about the gut. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I just wondered if you would explain to us um, terrain theory and how the body, the terrain uh, affects it versus germ theory. That would be really helpful. Absolutely, absolutely. So to do that, I need to take us... <clears throat> you know, just 400 years back. <laughs> so <laughs> we have like the turn of the 1600s and all of these things are happening in Europe. All of these civil wars are happening and people are really looking for another answer. And that's when science with a capital S starts to come into play. And by the 1800s, we have scientists and researchers looking at fermentation. So we have all these winemakers that don't want their wine to go bad, right? So they are employing all of these scientists to look at how microbes are affecting the fermentation process because microbes were something recently discovered at the time and it really threw everyone for a loop like there's a level of life that we never knew about and so these scientists were trying to ascribe meaning to these microbes what do they do what do they mean how do they fit into our world and it started with fermentation and it quickly went into disease states. And there were a couple different camps. The germ theory camp led by uh, Louis Pasteur and Koch, Robert Koch, they really uh, ascribed to the belief that each germ causes one disease. One germ causes one disease. And that's what germ theory is really playing on. How do we affect that germ so it doesn't cause disease? Now, terrain theory, which really, if you look at it, had been sidelined to 
um, biochemistry. At the time, all these researchers were trying to sort of solidify their camp, right? So like the first biologists were coming together. The first uh, microbiologists were coming together. And so the microbiologists like Pasteur were saying, hey, one microbe, one disease, that's the deal, treat the germ. Now, the other people, the biologists and the people that were looking at physiology, the birth of physiology and the science of physiology, really were talking about how the environment around the cell or organism or microbe dictates what that organism is going to do, dictates its behavior. And I think that that honestly is one of the exciting things about quantum biology because it's says exactly that. It really allows us to look at the physiology of the body, the interaction with microbes in a much bigger lens. And so that's really what we're looking at when we're talking about germ theory versus terrain theory. The idea that germs are responsible for disease and illness versus microbes and germs are part of the picture of an organism responding to their internal and external terrain. And uh, I think you can tell which camp I'm <laughs> um, <laughs> landing in. Absolutely. Do you think there's room for a little bit of both camps or not? Well, I absolutely think there's room for both camps if we remove that militaristic veil over everything, right? So the way that we talk about germs, the way that we have learned about them, the way that we approach them in medicine is very militaristic. Our immune system is a the defensive line, uh, the invaders or pathogens, the microbes are the enemy, and it's all framed in this militaristic attack fighting um, paradigm, and that's not reality. So are microbes part of the picture, disease and health and illness? Absolutely, absolutely. Are they the sole cause that we can you know, put our finger on as what is happening. No, absolutely not. We know that the terrain is really guiding what these microbes do and the conversation they have with our immune system. So yes, I think there's room for both camps, but it really hinders us when we have all of our language based in this fighting militaristic um, paradigm because that's not what's happening it's much more mutualistic yeah no and it also instills fear in you and we know that fear is the biggest suppressor of the immune system um you know one minute's fear i think um hits the immune system for six to seven hours whereas one minute's laughter boosts the immune system for 24 hours so you know that that's you know we live in fear of these germs and bacteria and fungi and everything and we're made up of them that's what we are um you know we are actually nature we kind of we've and we've separated ourselves very much from nature over the last well i suppose 50 years haven't we yes absolutely and and you know talking about that 1800s and the turn of you know science and medicine you really see that disconnect of, well, humans are up here and we go out and exploit facts and extract information and goodness from nature, right? That's really the paradigm that mainstream science has today globally. You know, Western science has really taken over the stage when it comes to science globally. And the way that they do it is is really by removing and elevating the human above all else. And we can go extract things and, you know, exploit things and really have that dominance over nature. But what I'm seeing is it is that piece of relationship that brings us help. It is that relationship that we have with nature, not the benefits, right? We can talk for hours and hours, we can have a whole series of podcasts on what the benefits of nature are. But what we should be talking about is how is our relationship with nature? 
when we flip the lens, the whole conversation flips. And so that's what I think about germ theory and terrain theory and how we really um, reconfigured the natural ecosystem around us into this hierarchy with us on top, you know, hands on our hip and, you know, microscope in hand. <laughs> and that's really not how the world works. No, it's absolutely not. And we're, we're made up of energy. And I talk about this a lot on the podcast. You know, we are just energy. And I don't know whether you tree hug. Are you a tree hugger? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so am I. <laughs> Every day I go and hug a tree. Uh, but you can actually feel the energy that you're getting. And uh, I, I did an interesting podcast last year with Guy Singh Watson from Riverford Farms talking about the fact that the trees connect under the soil and they support each other. And so if there's a little sapling tree and they're not getting the moisture or the energy that they need, that tree will, will send out the big tree, will send out the goodness that the little tree needs they're all there supporting each other and nature's there to support us and yet we've distanced ourselves from it and and i think that's most probably why um our energy in the world is quite low at, at the moment you know we are seeing sickness and disease and certainly your specialist fields in gut health autoimmunity um they are rampant like they have never been before in the history of mankind so what what do you think you know what do you think are the most the main drivers of that is that our disconnection with nature or the toxic food or air water that we're being um given what what do you think I think it's all of it, right? So um, there's no denying how much I love quantum biology. And really what that is, is the movement of photons, these small little particles, electrons and photons and photons, and how they create this vibration within the body that translates into biological action and health. So that means that if we are inside all day, and not connected with the vibration of the sun and those photons, then we can't access that level of health. When we aren't uh, coming in contact with trees or soil or that electron field that lines our earth, that's perfectly suited, right? We can collect those electrons from the soil, from a tree hug, from contact with nature, and that literally goes in and powers our biology. You know, the same thing we see for our communities. A lot of us are not living in communities that create this heart resonance and this frequency of coherence that's able to, again, power biology. What we're seeing is that we've been cut off from all of this um, amazing input in our environment. And now we are driving to work in our dark cars. We go into our cubicles. We're in artificial light all day. We go home. The sun is down. We get on our screens. Again, we're getting all this foreign vibration. Like if you think of it as energy and frequency, it's all vibratory junk and nonsense that doesn't help our body do what it needs to do. Our body was really designed to gather these inputs from our natural world and from our relationships, from our own mental state and sense of coherence. And we see that the toxins act as an obstacle, the way our societies are set up, the way our communities are set up, the collective um, fear and angst that we see in the last couple of years, that has a real effect on our biology and our health. And that's what I love about quantum biology is we can point to the studies, we can point to the footage and say, look, we see those quantum particles flowing. Um, so we can actually, we actually have evidence of this now, which is really exciting because it's time that science has caught up. If you are enjoying my work, please sign up to my webpage, phillyjlay.com, and you will receive my newsletters and an exclusive Walking Into Your Future meditation. And if you buy my course, The Wellness Way Faster Class, Your Natural Wellness Journey, you will get two amazing free bonus gifts. My Wellness Awakening album 
and a video on how I make my herbal teas. And for the full, completely uncensored videos of my podcast, you can come and find me on my Rumble channel, where my guests still have freedom of speech. And join me on my Locals Community channel, where I will be building my community and starting my weekly Zoom calls for the price of a cup of coffee a month. About evidence, I want to talk to you about easy water. So um, I saw the uh, TED TEDx TED Talk with uh, Dr. Gerald. Um, oh gosh, I forgot his name. Dr. Gerald Pollock. 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 There we go. Uh, which absolutely blew my mind when I saw it. And he mm -hmm. discovered the fourth stage of water, the exclusion zone water. Uh, it was actually uh, one of his students, wasn't it? By leaving a light on, but tell us that story. And, and, and can you not just tell us the story, but you know, everything that they discovered, because I think it is so crucial that if people knew um, what was going on here, you know, this is a great New Year hack. Once you know this in the new year and, you know, it's one of the things that, you know, we're going to touch on a few things today that you can do for free. Um, so can you talk us through that study, please? Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, Gerald Pollack and his team out of the University of Washington were the first to identify this new phase of water. And Pollack wrote the book, the fourth phase of water, describing all of this research. And he wasn't the first, right? This has been around for decades and researchers have been looking at this and knowing that there's something going on, but he was the first one to identify it, to record it, to give us pictures and, and video footage, right? We like to see it with our eyes. And he was the first to do that. And what he did was uh, he discovered this fourth phase of water. And when we talk about water, it's H2O, right? But the yep. fourth phase of water is H3O2. And if you're sort of math minded, then you notice that there's a missing proton there. There's a missing hydrogen, H2O, h 3 O2, there's one missing. So what's happening is these hydrogens are coming together in this fourth phase of water and they're more tightly bound. They form this hexagonal honeycomb sort of lattice shape. Um, and it forms in a sheet against hydrophilic surfaces or water loving surfaces. And we'll come back to that because it's really important. But they start to form against the surface of these water loving surfaces and one sheet forms and it acts as a template for more sheets to form. And they discovered this and they wondered why they would see different regions, different sizes of this fourth phase of water and wonder what is powering this structuring of water? And like you said, it was one of um, Gerald Pollack's research students went, uh, got hungry, left the light on, came back and saw an extraordinarily large structured water zone or easy exclusion water zone. Pollock um, termed it easy water because it also excludes that lattice formation, that hexagonal um, honeycomb lattice structure of the water actually acts to um, exclude any pollutants, any solutes at a certain size. It's actually been studied for desalination in freshwater sources. But um, what they found was that it is the light it is that infrared energy and the sun, we should mention, is the biggest source of infrared energy on the planet. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> and that's what they found. They found that infrared energy was what was increasing the structured water zone. And that when they turned the infrared light off, that zone quickly diminished over 10, 20 minutes. And so then they started really going for it and showing how these hydrophilic surfaces, these water loving surfaces are really the bulk of our surfaces in the body, our cell membranes, our fascia, which connects every single cell in the body via the cytoskeleton. So there's actually, you know, we have a 
collagen connective tissue matrix, this fascia that we used to think was just like this annoying thing you had to remove during surgery. Now we know. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, they did, didn't they? They do. Yeah, yeah still. Yeah, totally. Yep. Yep. <laughs> they still, this is what you learn in school. But the research, which we know it takes a long time for the two to catch up, the research is now showing that this is this body-wide communication network and it's hydrophilic, meaning that the outside of it and the inside of these collagen nanotubules of fascia that I'm talking about that connect us every single cell head to toe is lined with structured water on the inside and outside. And so what they did, they did this with synthetic nano uh, print, nathalon, you know, all of these synthetic hydrophilic materials to demonstrate this. And then they started using tissue from our body. They started using fascia and connective tissue. And they have actual footage of infrared energy being put. Like if we imagine a bin full of water and a little straw being placed in the bin, the straw is made of connective tissue and fascia, just like in our body. And you shine that infrared uh, heat source, light source onto that tub. And what you see start to happen within a few seconds is it starts to drive the flow of water. And it's being powered by this structured water zone that's on the inside and outside of this collagen um, fascial nanotubule. It's this triple helix, kind of like our uh, DNA, but one more helix in there creating these tubes that stretch throughout our body. And the infrared energy allows for the flow of water and the water is holding those um, quantum particles, electrons, protons. And what they found, it just keeps going on and on all these <laughs> mind blowing, right? It is, it really is. <laughs> Yes. And so what they found was that the structured water, as that structured water forms, remember, we're missing one of those hydrogens, right? So one hydrogen is kicked out and creates this proton wire right outside that structured water zone. So you've got a cell membrane, you've got the structured water zone forming, and then a proton wire just directly outside of that. And so what they did, Pollock and his team out of the University of Washington, placed an electrode in the negatively charged structured water and another one in the positively charged proton wire that forms just outside. And this was, the separation of charge was enough to light a light bulb wow. just for the, right wow right? so what we're seeing is that this structured water body within us creates a water battery and what's even more amazing is that it can actually hold on to this energy this energy from trapping quantum particles electrons protons photons of light phonons of sound frequency of our thoughts and emotions, like we've been talking about, this structured water that lines all of our cells and fascia is able to trap and hold these quantum particles for energy for later use. It's absolutely it's, amazing. I'm just going to ask you if you've got any advice for people that might be listening today that are night workers. What happens if you have to work at night? That's your job. Um, how do you, is there anything that you can do? Because I know that depression is, um, you know, the, the rates of depression are incredibly high in, in night workers. Um, any advice that you can give people? Yes, I think three things. Um, so when we're talking about the influence of light on our biology, we're really literally talking about the movement of those photons within our body causing biological action. So if we aren't um, 
in that circadian rhythm and we're a night worker, it's important for us to remember that sun and light isn't the only place to get it, right? Grounding is still available 24 seven. We can still come in contact with the earth and, and gather those electrons for biological action. Um, we can do that with our thoughts, meditation. Martin Picard has done amazing research on how meditation and positive thought increase our mitochondrial function, which helps with our mood, helps with circadian um, disruption. So I think first and foremost, it's not a dead end street. It is an obstacle for sure, but there are other ways to get this um, vibratory energy. Our food that we're talking about, right? All of those different colors and pigments in our food, our fats, our um, sources of clean animal protein, of seafood, all of these things have a vibration and a source of electrons that our body will ab absolutely use. And so it's important to not be like, well, here we are, shift worker, it's all, we're going to toss everything out the window. There's so much you can do, even if that circadian rhythm is disrupted. Now, my two favorite things, if the circadian rhythm is disrupted, blue blocking glasses and a red light device. So our blue blocking glasses just allow us um, to be in that night shift work without such a shift in our melatonin. And and such a shift in that blue light exposure, right? So if that is our main exposure, and I'm speaking about shift workers, but this is the case with a lot of patients that I see working regular hours too. Absolutely, because you know you work regular hours and then you go and watch a movie at night and then before you know it, it's one o'clock in the morning and you know, lots of people do this, yeah. uh, especially teenagers, you know. Um, so- Yes, absolutely. And they did a-, a, a research study just recently about kids and bright light bright light for just an hour decreases that melatonin by 90 percent um and that's significant for sleep cancer immune function neurological function and mood anxiety and depression yeah so that those blue blockers um which is a term for a lens that is blocking out the blue light and there are a bunch of different companies out there. If it's a good company, they will show you the research, right? I say this yep. about everything <laughs> um, yep. because it's expensive to do the research, right? So um, they will be showing you that. And it's just a matter of um, kind of dialing in that light environment. So um, I will talk with people about blue blockers. I will also talk with people about red light devices or lux meters, really assessing what their light environment is like, even when they're off the clock, right? So getting red light exposure, uh, you can, there are big panels, red light panels that are really, really expensive and they're little teeny devices that are way more affordable that you can set on, you know, the dashboard of your uh, car to drive in and to and from that shift um, yep. work day. And that in and of itself, getting a half an hour of that red light in the retinas is going to really allow for some of that biological action that we're looking to the sun for. So so I, I have to, so. I have to tell you actually, I um I did a podcast with Dr. Bradley Campbell, which is uh, mm -hmm. I discovered your work through him. Remarkable man, uh, and he was talking about a patient of his who was a dentist, and so he had. Uh, quite a lot of toxicity from mercury working with fillings. Um, and he had this very low libido and he had saunas and things. And then his wife, who was very health minded, bought a far infrared sauna uh, and he was going at it. And it made such a difference to his libido that he actually stopped using it because um he didn't want that much of an erection the whole time because all of a sudden his body was going, yay, because it had that far infrared sunlight. And you talk about, you know, a good company will tell you research. So the week after I did the interview with Dr. Bradley Campbell, I actually got sunlight and on 
the podcast to to talk about the research because there is you know huge amounts of research behind why this works it is really extraordinary and it works for you know a lot of chronic illnesses yes absolutely it should be the mainstay in every single cardiovascular unit in every hospital around the globe um, but it's not. We're, we're still in the state where uh, doctors are saying it's contraindicated for cardiovascular patients, for congestive heart failure. It's, it's, it's criminal, but that is sort of this trickle down thing we have in our society. I remember when I was a student, uh, the thyroid labs would come back extremely high, but in the normal range. So I called the lab and I was like, why are these normal? Like the endocrine society says these aren't normal. Like what is going on? And the woman said, we don't have enough uh, personnel manpower to educate wow. the doctors. So when enough doctors demand for a, a better, more tight, uh, more precise range, then we'll dial in our TSH, just what it was, you know? It's yeah. Just like, oh. No, I know it's extraordinary. I had um, a, a tumor taken out of my throat and I lost half my thyroid. So I've had you know thyroid mm-hmm. issues um, mm-hmm. and they were testing the whole time through. And, and, you know, the range is so wide. And I used to say to my doctor, you know, it's like me wearing size six shoes when I've got size three feet. You know, I can't I can't walk in this body. You know, it's it's a really massive range. And it's kind of it is criminal that they don't do something about this. And you have to go. Well, I know that you most probably have better testing in the US because it's private. But in the UK, we have the national health system, uh, and no, not not better. <laughs> it's yeah, not better. no, it's private, but it's not better. It's not better. Um, oh, um, well, you know, there, there's a, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I listen to my body now. Um, I let my body tell me what I need and, and when I need it. Um, so we've we've covered here uh, uh, three really really important things that I think people can do for free to start their new year. Get out in sunlight and look at the sun. Take your glasses off, even your normal ones. Get your grounding in um, and uh, drink, get your easy water. And there are other ways to get your easy water uh, as well. Things like coconut water has easy and green smoothies. So, you know, start your day. And we were talking earlier about the flavonoids, you know, so I start my day with a, a massive flavonoid smoothie. And I've got, you know, fruits from my garden that I freeze when they're in season. So I've got my apples. And a lot of people are really funny about fruit and say there's too much sugar in it. But the flavonoids that you get from the dark berries and the apples, you know, when I was a kid, your mum used to say an apple a day keeps the doctor away. So what do you think on that? I think that we're looking at a diet full of processed food and then putting, you know, apples and fruit on top of that and then the person says it doesn't feel good well that usually is a hint that you have a small intestinal um, bacterial overgrowth or fungal overgrowth because you're just creating this entirely different environment and it doesn't start with the fruit I'm a big fan of fruit Um, I think it's wonderful yeah but I just like you to tell our audience where they can find you and what resources that you've got. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm Dr. Catherine Clinton, and that's my website. That's my social media handle. So I'm very active on Instagram, uh, Facebook. So you can find me at Dr. Catherine Clinton, and that's how who I am. And I love this topic i share tons and tons of information all the time yep absolutely talking about this so come continue the conversation (laughs) listen we've come to the end of our podcast dr Catherine clinton it has been a complete and utter joy to have you here today thank you so so much for joining us and um i hope that we'll talk again you'll come back on one day again um it's like having a girls night in with you bloody love it me and all my favorite subjects (laughs) 
Thank you so, so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Catherine Clinton. If you would like to see more of this interview, please head over to my Rumble channel and join my locals community. We have never experienced such unbelievable censorship in the natural health community and Rumble is one of the very few places left to speak freely about what has happened to our health over the last few years and debate if Western medicine has been hijacked. I will never ask any of my guests to be censored, so I will be putting the full uncut video versions of all podcasts up for free. All you have to do is create an account if you haven't done so already. The link is in the show notes, and I would highly recommend that you come and join me. And you can sign up to my webpage for my newsletters and details of all my work, including my Telegram channel, which is also uncensored, if you would like to learn even more. Thank you.